as I always say, good, great number Sunday night. We appreciate uh, you being here so much. Um, I'll give you, uh, at the close of services, about the elections and uh, the offerings and stuff this morning. And we get by ourselves at the end of the service, we'll go over that. But other than that, we certainly appreciate uh, you being here tonight. I want to uh, open with prayer tonight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, as I always do for Sunday. God, that's it's always, and I was thinking about it, what a special day it is. And God, I, I ride around and I see people just doing all kinds of things on the Lord's day. 15, 20 years ago, they never thought of doing. But God, it's just become another day. Lord, uh, I think that's one of the signs of, of the end of time that God not only is the Lord's house and his word not respected no more, but even the day he set aside is not respected anymore. But God, I thank you for the folks here that are faithful to come and, and to be with us and to worship with us. And God, I pray now that that, Lord, as we come together to worship, that, Lord, you would be in our midst. I always pray that. God, that as we preach the messages, God, that you might speak to somebody's heart. Lord, bless us now as we worship together. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want just to announce, to remind you that um, next Sunday night we will have baptismal services here at the church. So just, that's always a, a, a special night when, when we can do baptism in our churches today. So just, just keep that in mind. That's the only now. I want to uh, share with you now as we have our mission moment to share with you a story of, <clears throat> of a couple out in Oakland, California. It says that Oakland, California has become an increasingly diverse city that does not have, this is sad words here, that does not have a deep connection with Christ in that city. But then I saw that, but that's most cities. 2018, King and Jamie Smith moved to the city, began reaching out to the community. When they started a new church, the first baptism was a person who had been a professing atheist until he came to that church. First baptism, that's something to remember. They continued to proclaim and share the gospel in their community as well as serve residents who are facing challenges in the city. When the public schools had to shut down during the COVID-19 time, their church was able to step in and provide meals for folks and immigrants and folks that were struggling just to have enough food to eat. And so, again, our mission monies that we give from our church goes to help people all over the world in the United States and Oakland, California, who knows where our money goes and how many people are touched by what we give through the cooperative program of the Baptist Convention. So, uh, again, we thank you for that. At this time, I'm going to ask Mimi to come. and She's going to lead us in our, our song tonight. There's something about that name, and our ushers will come and take up our mission offering, a dollar or whatever you want to give tonight. Uh, you do that. <laughs>
something about the name of Jesus. Case is going to come and, and have our special music tonight, and then I'll bring you, I hope, a short message tonight. <clears throat> halfway job with it last Sunday night, and so I'm going to try to do a little better tonight than I did then, because this is one of, I think, overlooked prophecies that there is in the Word of God, and we started on it a little bit last night and gave a few examples, but today this is what I've thought about, how the world has changed in the last two or three years 
how the world has changed since I came here. It's nowhere near what it used to be. And I think most of you can agree. And that the Bible talks about as we approach and we near the end of time, the birth pains, that the closer we get, the harder the pain gets. Casey sang about that in her song about the pain. Well, we live in a world today that's full of pain. You make no bones about it. It's a sad commentary of the world that we used to live in. But the saddest thing is this, how quickly it has changed. Just think about where we were three years ago, four years ago. The world in this country is nothing like it was four years ago. It has been a radical change that has hit. As God predicted, as we, as we approach and we come to the end of those times, do not be surprised. And kind of as I told you last Sunday night, that it's much easier, and some things go unnoticed. We know, as Jesus told us in the first part of his prophecy in, in Matthew 24 and 10, how he said that in the last days would be pestilence, in the last day would be uh, storms and, and all these different things that were going to happen to the world as we approach the end of time. We, we, we understood those things. And it's easy to preach those things. When he talked about nation against nation, wars and rumor, all that, I spent a little past, I did spend months talking about that. You understood that, I think, that I understood. But when I come to that part of verse 10 that I tried to start last Sunday night, and then shall many be offended, and you shall betray one another. The deeper I look into that, the more I see that that is happening in the world that I live in today. But that is something that Satan slips in, and you hardly ever will notice what's going on. You just think about one of the prophecies of the ten prophecies Jesus gave, that as the end of time gets closer, he uses the word betrayed. Betrayed. Most people will never think of that as a prophecy of Jesus as it was in the end times. But what he's saying is this. As we get closer to the end, how these things that people overlook and don't think much of, how they're going to intensify and how they're going to get worse in the world that you and I live in as we approach the end. The, one of the great problems with betrayal. Betrayal is when people lie to you. Betrayal is when they tell you something that they don't mean. Betrayal is when they go behind your back, tell you one thing to your face, and they do something else completely different. There are many avenues that you can go down when it comes to betrayal. Many. And many po people have been betrayed. What, a, what is one of the most painful things that happens to you. When somebody betrays you, brings about as much pain mentally and physically, spiritually as it can, when somebody betrays you, somebody says, tells you something that is not true, and all of these things that are going to happen, the trouble is this. 
in a world that you and I are living in today? Who can we trust? Who can we say, I believe what he says or what she says with certainty? And they're going to do what they say. Now, what I want to tell you tonight, when Jesus said in the last days that people will betray one another, that neighbors will turn against each other in these last days, understand this. Betrayal is nothing new in the Bible. Betrayal occurs many times. In the Word of God. And I want to just share a couple of those things with you to know that Jesus knew. What did he say when he met with his disciples for that last time? <coughs> Excuse me. For that Lord's Supper. What was the last thing that he said in there? One of you will do what? Betray me. So he knows what he's talking about. One that had been his confidant. One for three years that had walked with him, saw his miracles and saw everything. But for 30 pieces of silver, he turned his back on him. Folks, people will lie for a lot less than 30 pieces of silver today. You mark that down. People will lie for much less than that and cause harm and hurt, as it did when Jesus was there, and he was. But let me tell you where it first began at. It first began up in heaven. God, before he ever created man, woman, or anything on the earth, he was in heaven. He had the angels. He had his creations, his servants and stuff up there. One of the most beautiful that he had was one named Lucifer. He sat under God. He listened to God. He watched God work in heaven. He watched what God did. And he says what? You, we know this story. I want to be him. Now, whatever it takes to be him, I'll do. I'll lie, I'll cheat, I'll steal. But I want that throne. Men today are just like Satan in the fact that they live for power. And they have no hindrance to what they might do to attain that power. That's the world we live in today. Satan said, I'll take his throne away from him. I'll take his angels away from him. The one that God created, who was the most beautiful, most powerful up there, and God had placed him there, and what did he do? He betrayed God. He betrayed God. That's where betrayal began up in heaven. And the Bible says that the mighty angel deserted his God and led a host of angels in rebellion against him. Ezekiel said that I ordained and anointed you as a mighty angel, a guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God, and yet you deserted God. The first betrayal that ever occurred was when Satan betrayed God up in heaven. We know that God kicked him out of heaven. And God sent him down here with us. Betrayal has been ever since. Started with the first couple, Adam and Eve, who in the garden in perfection, in perfection, the perfect place, were seduced by the wiles of Satan and turned their back on God, turned their back on him. They betrayed what God had put them there for what they had done. The first brothers 
Cain and Abel, brothers, flesh and blood. And Cain betrayed him. And Cain killed him. You see, it's always been. And God says, and Jesus said, as we approach the end of the same thing. Remember the story of two brothers whose name was Jacob and Esau? One had the blessing. The other had the blessing. He wanted what that brother had. And so he lied to him. He lied to his daddy. He lied to his mama. And know what? He took what didn't belong to him. Betrayed his own brother. Nothing new under the sun, folks. Joseph. Joseph, who his own brothers stripped his clothes off of him, threw him in a hole, and were going to kill him in that hole. But one brother said, let's don't kill him. Let's sell him. That's his own flesh and blood. I've never seen as much arguing of flesh and blood and families as I witness in a world that I live in today. You hear this? So that's what they did. Delilah. Remember Delilah? Who lied to her husband? Betrayed her husband, told him that she loved him, got him in a weak moment, and said after he'd refused time and time again to tell him where his strength come from. She begged and she begged. He told her what? That it was his hair. What did she do? She went to the Philistines and said, I got it. So in essence, what she was saying is what? Y'all do what you want to with him now. Her own husband. Betrayal. I can go on and on and on. One of the greatest men that the Old Testament and the Jewish people ever dreamed of. And even you go to Israel now, and they've got things named after him, even a hotel all over where, and that was King David. What happened to him? His own son betrayed him. Tried to do what? Take his own throne away from him. Nothing new under the sun. And listen to what David wrote in the 55th Psalm. This is not an enemy who taunts me, David said. Then I could bear it if it were an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you talking to his own son, a man, my equal, my companion, and my friend. It hurts the most of all things when it's friends that turn their back on you. It hurts of all things when it's family that betrays. Happens the world is full of this stuff today, and I could go, On and on. But nothing. I don't believe. And this is strictly my opinion here. Nothing matches the betrayal of Judas to Jesus for me. After all that he had done, Luke said this. Luke 22, 3 and 4. He says, Satan has entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. 
So he went his way and conferred with the chief priest and captain. This is what Jesus said about him, that he may betray, betray me to them. Jesus calls it out. And he calls him out because of betrayal. So almost in the Bible from beginning to end, there's betrayal. Remember what we're talking about, though. Those are things that happened thousands of years ago. As you get to the end of time, as I keep repeating, It will be prevalent in a world that you and I live in today. In a world that I live in today, I'm going to just speak from my position. I'm very careful who I put my trust in. I'm very careful who I listen to. I don't care if they're preachers or who they are. But the closer I get and the more I see and people that I had and preachers that I respected for almost all of my ministry. And I listen to some of the things that say now. And I say this. What happened to them? They didn't used to preach that. They didn't used to preach that. But they had betrayed many times the Word of God by not preaching the truth of the Word of God. The truth will set you free, folks. The truth is hard sometimes. But truth will always be truth whether it's easy or whether it is hard. Many will be offended. You will betray one another, he says. So here we have a prophecy of many different things that Jesus said to look for as we come toward the end of time. This is the one, I think, that is the most emotional. I think that being betrayed is the one that leaves the most wounds in our lives, more so than maybe the earthquakes or the pestilences or all the other things that are going to happen. And When I look at something like this, this is what I say. You would ask most people, tell me as much as you can about the signs of the end. Tell me, tell me what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Most people will say there'll be pestilences or there'll be earthquakes. There's going to be all these things. But very few people will say betrayal. And yet Jesus puts it right alongside all of those other things that we'll take and believe. He does that. He uses the word, not only will you hate one another, he says, not only will you be betrayed, but you will hate one another. So he says, as we come closer to the end, what's going to happen in a world of the end times? There'll be more hatred and more division than there has ever been in the world. That's the world I live in today. A world of division, a world of hatred, and yet Jesus prophesies it right here in his word. You will betray one another and you will hate one another. The word hate that he uses in the scripture in the Greek literally means to scandalize. Scandal. Scandal. That word offended that he uses there. And it's used 30 times in the New Testament itself. 
And what it says, it means this. A trap that will cause somebody to fall and get hurt. A trap. He said, in the last days, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I know about my wife. We trip and fall every once in a while. Me and her both. Sometimes we fall in familiar places. Sometimes, like I did four or five months ago at the drugstore, back in the back talking with the lady that's the pharmacist, and I turned around to step back where I ought to be in, fell flat on my face right in the middle of the drugstore. Sometimes, listen to this now, sometimes Satan uses people to set traps for us. That's what he does now. The English Bibles translated this, and they will lead many into sin. There is so much evil and darkness in the world that I live in today. As I said, I'm very careful who I trust, who I listen to, who I put my faith in. Very careful about that. More so than I've ever been in my life. Because there are many out there that what? Would like to see you fall, your marriage messed up, me fall, my ministry messed up, and we always have to be aware of that because that's exactly what Jesus said would happen in the end of time. So we have to be careful who it is. When a Christian begins to engage in sin, this is hard, but it's the truth. You know what? Anybody. I'll I, I, I rephrase that. When anybody engages in a sin, most of the time, if you're not careful, they will take somebody down that road with them. But very seldom do you sin or I sin and do something wrong that it does not affect our families, the people we know, the people that we love. And that's what he wants from us. What do you think makes Satan happier than anything else other than people going to hell? It's to see those that claim the name of Christ, to see those that call themselves Christians mess their life up because of some stupid thing that they got led into. Because then people will say what? Look what that preacher did. I'm good as he is. All my life, from the time I even knew what I was doing or knew anything about Scripture, this is what I always heard. I don't go to that church because there's hypocrites in it. I always heard that. I ain't never been in a church where somebody outside didn't say that somebody in there was a hypocrite. Heard it all my life. And I'll tell you this story. I believe it's true because I was that one they were talking about. People out there knew how I lived. People in here saw me live a different life. So that's true many times. And we were led that, so we have to be careful. But I'll stop with this. I've already touched on this just a few minutes ago. I'm going to quit with this. And I... And I I think most of you know that when I preach, I pour my heart out to you exactly how I feel. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not so good. That's, that's just who I am. The thing that really has dampened my trust and faith is this. Preachers that have departed from the sound preaching of the Word of God. That breaks my heart. 
And all I got to do is cut a TV on. And I can find it. It breaks my heart when a Christian makes a great sin in his life that harms the name of Jesus. Because, and listen, we all people always do this. Ethical failures in your life. What does that do? It sends people that might have think about being a Christian, it sends them away when they see me mess up ethically in my life. That's what it do. But I guess the thing, and you say, well, preacher, you on your high, I ain't on no high horse. I'm just telling you my heart right now. Betrayed. Betrayed. It's when a church or a people or a denomination begins to minimize sin in the society that we were led to tell about Jesus and we begin to minimize the sin that the Bible talks about. That breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. Because what that does to that unbeliever is it gives him a license to sin and think it's okay. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Let me close with this. There are a lot of sins that you can commit in life. Let's be honest about it. And we've all done it. But I think Paul got it right. The real danger of you sinning, me sinning, is this. That I become a stumbling block to those that look at me. People look at us and we mess it up, we become a stumbling block sometimes to them. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I ain't perfect, and I don't claim to be, and I know I'll never be, but that's okay. God knew I would never be when he saved me. But I don't want to be a stumbling block. I want to openly do something that would cause somebody to say, I don't want that Jesus he's got. If that's what Jesus does, Count me out. I don't want that. Betrayal. And if I do that, I have betrayed the one that saved me. That's what I've done. He said in the last days, that kind of stuff will be more prevalent than it's ever been. And folks, that's the world I live in today. That's the world that these eyes hears. You may not see that world. That's the world I see when I read the word of God. Thank you all for being with us. We'll pick it up next Sunday. I don't know if I'll preach that next Sunday. We'll see. It's baptism night. I don't know what I'll do, but we'll, we'll do something. All right. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Right, I'm through.